Well, good morning, Christ Church Butterfield family. How is everybody doing this morning? Did I hear one person say good? Oh, two people. Okay, there you go. If you're in the atrium, hey, we want to invite you to come on in. If you're in the, in the room here, we're so glad that you have joined us this morning. And if you've tuned in online, we want to say a big welcome to you. You might be at home or traveling. We're so glad that you are here. You know, this morning, our very first song is, going to, is called Christ is Our Firm Foundation. And I found scripture that says... Uh, that talks about Christ being our firm foundation. And I'd like to read that to you this morning. It's Matthew 7, 24 through 27. It says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And the rock is who? Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together as we worship our Lord and Savior this morning. I want to encourage you to get involved. Sing out loud, as loud as you can. And let's see what God does through our worship. This is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking. Well, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. No, he won't. No, he won't. still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful going to fail us. He never has and he never will. The wind came and the, the rain came and the wind came. Nothing happened because we stood faithful with him, right?
God, we give him praise, amen. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we introduced a new song called The Lord's Prayer. Suzanne, why don't you take it away? So you remember this, you know the words. Clap your hands with us as we sing out these words. Father, let your kingdom come here. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here. got a question for you. How many of you believe our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God Almighty, God the Holy Spirit are here three in one with us this morning? He is here working in this place. Amen. You are here moving in our midst. Sing it out. Come on. Worship you. I worship you. Sing it out now. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are a make miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Sing again. You are. You are. I 
louder. Come on now. I worship you. You are here, and in every heart, I worship you. Yes, I worship you. You are playmate, miracle work, promise scheme, light in the darkness. I know that is who you are. Thank you that we sing with confidence today that that is who you are. You are a way maker, Lord. You are a promise keeper. You are our light in the darkness. So many days this year, Lord, it seems like there's just darkness in the news. There's darkness in the world around us. But we know that you are the light and your light will overcome the darkness, Lord. There is no darkness that is bigger than your light, Lord. And we just thank you for that truth this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, before I send you to a time of greeting one another, I just want to make you aware that the uh, technology goblins came last night and they took one of our screens. And so, if you're, uh, before we get, spend the time saying hi to one another, maybe if you're over on this side of the room and you, you're going to want to be able to see the screen for the rest of the service. So if you're good looking at it that way, great. But if not, as we're doing a time of greeting, if you want to migrate your seat over to, you know, middle or this side of the room, feel free. With that, uh, would love for, to invite everyone to stand, say hello to someone around you and tell them good morning and how happy you are that they're here.
Well, wonderful, wonderful. Um, hope you had the chance to say hi to someone new or reconnect with someone that maybe you haven't seen in a minute or two. Uh, and, and just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome to those of you who are online and to those of you who are in the person and, and finding your seats. We're so glad that you're here. If we have not had an opportunity to meet yet, my name is Charlie Browning and I'm the campus pastor here at our Butterfield campus of Christ Church, and I'm, I'm so glad that you're here, um, and we are so glad that you're here, whether you're joining us from the couch somewhere or whether you're here in person with us. Hey, uh, for you who are specifically uh, either new to the church or you're feeling a little bit disconnected from the church, or if we just haven't met before, I want to invite you to do something after the service. I, I want to invite you to come join me for Christ Church in Five. Uh, and what that is, is, is it's an opportunity for, for you to say hi, and I would love to meet you right up here after the service in front if you're here in person. Um, and I'll share with you just that, Christ Church, what we do here, what we're about, who we are, and what gets us excited in five minutes. And then I'd love to hear a little bit about you and, and what makes you excited as well. And so I want to invite you to that after the service. If we haven't had a chance to meet, or if you're... Uh, feeling new or feeling disconnected from the church, would love to meet you right up here for Christ Church in Five after the service. Uh, we're, if you're, we're, you can tell if you're in person right now that we have what we call our family worship Sunday going on, uh, which means that some of our younger generation is joining us as well. If you're maybe a kid in the area, could you maybe scream or shout for me real quick to tell me that you're out there? Give me a woohoo. Woo! Hi, everyone. We're so glad that you're here um, and that you're joining us in, in, the, in the big church this Sunday. And, and I, I want to make a little bit of a note for you guys specifically and for our entire congregation here of what's happening in kids' ministry in the month of August because we're going to do it a little bit differently. You see, you, you, and you may have seen in an email that came out this week, one of the things that we're really excited about is we're making some updates to the children's ministry area so that it's even more fun, even more exciting to come to church on a Sunday morning and hang out with your friends. Well, what that means is we're going to need a little bit of time to pull that off. And so instead of our normal rhythm of children's ministry in our different classrooms every Sunday— during, through the month of August, so for the next three Sundays, we're going to have what we call Kids Gather Sundays. And so what that means is that when you come to church for the next three Sundays, if you're a kid, everybody's going to meet in the cow room, which is normally where our middle schoolers hang out. And so we're going to have one big hangout and party together with all ages. And Miss Kathy and some volunteers will be there, and we'll get to play some games and do some crafts. And maybe there will be a snack involved as well as a lesson. So all the normal things that you get on a Sunday, it would just be everybody together in the cow room. And so if you're a parent and you're thinking about check-in for the next couple weeks, or if you're a kid and you're wondering where you're going, that's what's happening through the month of August. You can get really excited about uh, joining for one of our Kids Gather Sundays. Uh, so I wanted to make you aware of that. Well, one of the things that we love doing as a church is highlighting and celebrating some of the stories of the people of our church. And, and, and when you're a big church that spans multiple different campuses, you can't highlight everyone's story, but we especially wanted to highlight this particular story of Lynn and, Lynn and Jim Francois. And so we've got a video that I'd love to show you uh, where we get to hear a little bit more about their story. Show sure, great. 32, 10, 20. My name is Jim Francois. And I'm Lynn Francois, and most people at Christ Church call me Lenny. And we've been going there since... Since 2013. And we settled into Contemporary, and we have lots of friends there, and that's, that's where I go now every Sunday, and Jim live streams. One of the first things we did was hospitality. Yes. Jim was really good at We were that. both on the hospitality yeah. team, welcoming people, greeting people yeah. as they came in. Yeah. And yeah. then, it, I wasn't there long when I joined the well and um, jumped in with both feet. And I loved it. 
They were so welcoming because I walked in knowing not one single woman. I was told in uh, November of 2017 that I had ALS. But ALS is a neurological disease in which your, uh, your nerves stop sending the signals to your uh, muscles and you can no longer move and it's a uh, progressive so with me it started in my one arm and my neck but uh, that over time spread to my other arm and my hand but very very importantly my breathing I, I can't breathe at all without being on the ventilator. A little bit of discomfort in stiffness and so forth, but, uh, yeah. you know, but I'm able to, uh, I'm still inside, I'm still, I'm still the same person. Yeah. Mentally and emotionally and spiritually. We were at the Super Bowl party with a group of Christchurch friends, and all of a sudden, I couldn't breathe. I've never had an experience like that before. And uh, I suffered respiratory failure, thank God. There were people there who knew what to do. And then looking back upon it, that was a real blessing. I woke up in the emergency room at the hospital. And here was this group of Christchurch friends standing around the bed that I was in, reading scripture and praying. That was the worst thing that ever happened to me. And again, it was one of the best things because but I knew that God had planned it that way for those friends to be there. I think community has played a large role in the life of Jim and Lynn. I think that they didn't know it at the time, but they were setting up a group of people that would gladly step forward and be with them and support them in whatever they were doing. When I worry that I'm not praying enough, I know that everyone else is standing in the gap for me mm -hmm. and praying for yes. me and praying for yes. that healing for Jim mm -hmm. and for strength to carry on. And um, that really, um, just means everything to me. I know that when I was a little boy, the Holy Spirit entered my body. But you know, Jesus came in and uh, he's been with me all those years. My body might be failing, but, but he's not. Jesus is still here with me and, uh, and he's helping me through this. What a powerful story of just one couple in the life of our church who's experienced Jesus through the community that exists around them. Now, I don't know about you, but as I watch that video and read that story, one of the things that's most striking to me is just how incredible it is to have a group of people around you like that who can meet you in the hospital, um, pray with you, read scripture with you and over you. Uh, and, and, and in some ways, I, I'm, I'm jealous of Jim and Lynn for having that. And, and I wonder if, how that strikes you, if that's something where you think, boy, it would be incredible to have that type of community. And, and as a church, we want to be a, a group that allows you to enter into that. And one of the most easy ways to do that, to be surrounded with that community, is to join a group. And specifically, if you've never joined a group before, to join a rooted group. Uh, you may have no clue what that means. Let me try to summarize it for you as quickly as possible. Starting in September, we're gonna launch what we call rooted groups. It's a 10-week group series where you have the opportunity to go deep into scripture, to, to be alongside one another, and to create that exact type of community that the Francois were just talking about, people who are there for you in every aspect of life. And so if you have not joined a rooted group yet, and you are thinking about it, or God's maybe pushing you to do that this fall, I would highly, highly encourage you to do so. September 11th is when they start 
So you've got time to think about it. But we invite you after the service to connect with Heather Franklin, our new First Impressions and Groups Coordinator. She'll be right outside at the Connections desk in the Commons area. She's got a big name tag on. You can't miss her. Um, she'll be able to answer any questions to give you more, in, more details about what that might look like. And I would highly suggest that you go say hi, introduce yourself, and ask her more about what it would look like for you to join a rooted group. And it, it also strikes me one of the things that we can't do in just a couple minute video is tell the entire story of somebody, the entire story of a person. Well, one of the things that we weren't able to tell about the Francoise in that small glimpse is, is what their community around them spoke of how generously they lived their lives. That, that, that if you ask people that know the Francoise well, they'll tell you without a doubt, no, that family, they live with generosity in every aspect of their life. That's how they exude Jesus. And, and when we ask them, well, Lynn and Jim, well, what causes you to desire to live a generous lifestyle every single day in that capacity? Uh, they just said this. They said, the love of God and the love of other people. And, and Jim even went on to say, he said, we, we've, we're, we're so stirred by the love of Jesus that we've gotten to the point where once we're no longer here on this earth. We've made plans so that everything that God has given us, it's all going to go back to him. And I just wonder as we spend time in a moment of generosity, as we continue our worship, how that strikes you. And if you too would be someone who would be willing and excited and inspired by the idea of giving generously like the Francois. So as we continue our time of worship into a time of offering, would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for the story of one couple that uh, uh, represents the story of so many others um, in this room, around our church, and around the world, people who you've captivated their hearts and they're chasing after you. We thank you that that is true of them, and may that be true of so many others. So uh, as we enter into this time of worship, would you move in our hearts in a way that compels us to be people who are generous as you've equipped us to be. In your name, amen. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say Though the storms may come and the winds may blow I'll remain steadfast And let my heart learn when you speak a word It will come to pass Great is your faithfulness to me Great your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me friends why don't you stand and join us as we sing together There's nothing you can't do, you're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart burn when you speak a word, it will come to Say hey. 
middle of our summer light series if this is your first time uh, joining us during that series. What it is is a time through about the, uh, the month of August that we invited guest speakers throughout the entirety of our church, people both locally and nationally who have come to share a word with us from a variety of contexts. And, and it's such a gift to be part of that. And so I, I want to introduce our, our next speaker who will be joining us from our our classic service at our Oakbrook campus and be streaming the message to all of our other services and locations. But before I do so, I want to make a note. If you have little ones with you in the service and uh, sometimes listening for a long time, you need to get your wiggles out. There, uh, down the hall, the second room on the left outside of our uh, auditorium right here. is called our family room. Uh, the, there's, we have the worship service and the message streaming on a TV in that room, and it's got a little rug and some couches and some toys and things like that. If you just need to get the wiggles out and spend a little time outside the context of the auditorium, the family room down the hall on your left is, is definitely open to you, so please feel free to take advantage of that. Uh, but the, the, our preacher today, our, our guest speaker, his name is Sean Palmer. Uh, some of you may recognize the name. He's the teaching pastor at Iglesia in, down in Houston, an incredibly passionate, vibrant speaker who is so gifted in so many ways. He's an author and public speaker. He has a number of books as well as he travels literally the world speaking um, and sharing the gospel of Christ with others. And so we're so excited to have Sean here. He's a a friend of the church, and specifically some on our pastoral staff know him very well. And so looking forward to you hearing from him. And so could we give a warm welcome, although he's far away, to Sean Palmer. Well, I've had a great weekend here in Chicago. I came a couple of days early with my oldest daughter, who is, who is 18, and she's a big uh, art and art history fan, and so we got to take in some of the sites of Chicago. And why that's really important to me is because this is the last trip that the two of us have before she leaves to go away to college. So in 13 days, uh, she enters into her freshman year as a sociology major at the University of Texas. And, and so this last year, what no one had told us when we started her senior year is that you would have this great urge there last year to make sure that all of the things that you had wanted to teach them, that you wanted them to experience while they were in your home, that this is kind of your last shot at it. Because I remember coming home after my first semester of college and feeling like a completely different person. And quite frankly, my mom saying that I was a completely different person. And this was it. So this last year... We have been downloading to her and to her younger sister all the experiences that we had that we wanted to share that we hadn't covered already. And what I realized this last year is that her world is so much different than my world. Like when I, when I was her age, when I was 18, there was a completely different life. And it wasn't just things like social media and the internet. And those are part of it. But I was just raised different. Like, I tell them things about the way that I was raised that absolutely blows their mind. Like, they don't even understand. Like, I was raised in the local church, and I tell them stories about being a kid, and we would go to worship in the morning at our church and then go home and do all of the things that we would do on a Sunday afternoon. And then we would get dressed and go back to church on Sunday night. And they think this is incredible. And if you were raised in church, you might remember going to Sunday night service in your local church. If you don't, let me tell you what it was like. It was like going to the JV service. Like you had all of the people who normally and regularly do things, do them on Sunday morning, and then people who weren't quite good enough to do it on Sunday morning, 
Like they would be the ones on Sunday night. And they don't get that. And I was born in Mississippi and raised there until I went to junior high. And there are things that parents used to do then that they don't do now. Like I, I'm not endorsing it. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't do it. But in the house that I grew up in, me and my older brother, like we were spanked. And in Mississippi, when you're a black family in Mississippi, you don't actually get spanked. You get whooped. <laughs> and it happened so many times. I can barely recall all of them, but I do remember one of them. I was in the fourth grade, and for whatever reason, my mom wasn't working at the time. And so whatever happened between the time I left school and walked home, this is when my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Moore, called my mother and said that I had been disrespectful. And when I walked through the front door of my home, my mother lit me up because she very much was a whoop first, ask questions later kind of lady. And I had no idea what had happened. I have no idea why I got this punishment. And right in the middle of it, when you're getting it right in the middle of it, like that's not the time to ask. But I didn't know what I had done wrong. And to this day, I still don't know what I did wrong. And it bothered me so much that I eventually came around to ask my mom, hey, do you remember when I was in fourth grade and you're that day and you weren't working and I, as soon as you got home and all of that? And she goes, kind of. I said, what did I do wrong? And she goes, that was forever ago. I don't know. So I don't remember and she doesn't remember what I did wrong, which created in me this sensitivity for me personally, for people I'm close to, but globally too, when people experience harsh consequences. And I can't tell what they did wrong. So a good friend of mine earlier this summer challenged me to read text and preach from text that I had never done before. And one of them was this one from Genesis 11. Genesis 11 tells us this. It says, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth. Then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, look, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And when I read that, what did they do wrong? Do you know, there have been excavations of lower Mesopotamia and one of the things that they have found is that across lower Mesopotamia, they have found about 300 towers. And these towers, at most, are about seven stories high. And when you go back and read the literature of the time, do you know what it says about these towers? 
It says that they were towers to the heavens. Because we all know what that means, right? When someone says that something is reaching into the heavens, when we talk about the heavens. Like one, one of my favorite bands is this couple named Johnny Swim. And, and they have some Houston connections, but I love one of their songs called Touching Heaven. Do you know what it's about? It's about their newborn son and holding their newborn son. And that's touching heaven. Now, I've had newborns. I've changed diapers. There ain't nothing about touching heaven. <laughs> like in the 1960s, with the Gemini, Mercury, and Apollo missions from NASA. Do you know what they said we were doing? We're going to the heavens. And no one who has actually said that they were touching heaven or going to the heaven actually believes that they were going to heaven. It's just the way we talk about things that are beyond us. So what what did they do wrong? I think it's even more confusing if you've ever read Genesis 10. Because Genesis 10 says this. The descendants of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javon, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The descendants of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphoth, and Tagamar. The descendants of Javan, Elisa, Tarshish, Katim, and Rodami. I work really hard on those for you all. <laughs> From these coastland peoples spread. These are the descendants of Japheth in their lands with their own language, by their families, in their nations. So before you even get to Genesis 11, where this story of building a tower and God comes down to confuse their language, you've already got people spread across the earth in their own language, in their own nations. So now I've got two questions. The first is, what did they do wrong? And the second is, what is this story about? Like, what am I supposed to do with this? And so when my friend asked me about this, I said, I don't know that I could ever possibly preach either one of those passages because I don't know what's going on. And so there is not a sermon in this passage that I can preach. But there are some options if I were going to preach a sermon from this text. The first option, maybe that I would talk about this word, prolepsis. And prolepsis is just a big word when you're saying things out of order. Because all of us have been in an American history class at some point, and you get to that part where they're talking about Abraham Lincoln, and a teacher or someone says, President Lincoln was born in Kentucky. Well, you know good and well that he wasn't born president in Kentucky. You know that later on, he becomes president, but that's where he was born, and so for presidents, we just refer to them as president for the rest of their lives. And so what prolepsis is, is just telling a story out of order, assuming that you already know the actual order, and maybe that's what's going on. But why would you do it this way? Why would you tell a story this way? I mean, I know some bad storytellers. I worked with a bad storyteller. I was in student ministry for a long time, and she had been in student ministry at the same church years before, and she kept telling the story about this time that they had 500 kids in their youth ministry when I had like 15. I was there one time there was a whole group of people who came together from a lot of different churches, and you had 500 kids in the building. That's a terrible story. Learn how to tell a story. But I wouldn't tell it this way especially now. Like in our time in the 21st century, where so many people are not only suspicious of the Bible, 
but of Christians themselves? Like, that's a time where you want to you wanna get your story straight. And then you're always going to have these folks, both Christian and non-Christian, but mostly Christian, who really don't understand how to read Scripture. And so they open up the Bible, and they want to find the scientific method from the Bible of how to figure things out, given everything that we know about the modern world. So you've got this group of people who are off on a quest somewhere to find Noah's Ark, because they really believe that once they find it, more people will believe in God, even though the Jews themselves, the Hebrews, had a pillar of fire by day, pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, and that evidence didn't help. And in today's world, where it seems like every month, if you're paying attention, there is some church scandal where some Christian leader is in the news for being a very good leader but not a very good Christian. Suspicious folks would look at that and go, see, they can't even get their own story straight. But there's another option. Because before me and before you, there had been a long tradition of people who had read this book. They are the Hebrews, the Jews. And they read this story, and they put these two stories together, and they say, nope, that's not prolepsis at all. That's exactly how it happened. But there's a bigger piece of it. And they would say this story is really about imperialism. That God has done this work, and there are people all over the world. And what's happened is that one group of people have decided that every other group of people should be exactly like them. And how do you do that? How do you start to do that? One language. You will become like us. And so it is the people with the greatest power, the greatest money, the most powerful military, and they come in and they conquer other people and say, you will speak our language and in this story this tower isn't just a tower it's a military monument and you know one of the purposes for military monuments to remind the conquered that they are conquered and who conquered them Because long before Vladimir Putin sent his armies into Ukraine, just a few years ago, he said, I'm only interested in the Russian-speaking parts of Europe. And a century before that, Adolf Hitler said, I'm only interested in the German-speaking parts of Europe. One language, one language to rule them all. And I know when we hear that, we go, well, I'm not a president or a czar. I'm not in charge of a nation or even a city-state. But don't lots of people have little ways that we try to make everyone else just like us? Like deep down, don't you think that the world would just be a little bit better if more people were like me. If they thought like me, if they voted like me, if they saved like me, if they spent like me, if they raised their kids like I raised mine, if they, kinda, if they had the kind of relationship with their spouse that I have, why in the world do those people have to do things that way? But no one ever thinks that they function that way. So if I were to preach this text, I wouldn't talk about imperialism. And nobody thinks that the story being out of order is their fault. So I wouldn't preach about prolepsis. But there are still some other options. What if it really is about what it seems to be about? Just selfish ambition. But here's the problem 
with selfish ambition. I have never met a person ever who thought that they were selfish. None. Zero. No one ever thinks that they're selfish. I and mean, even if you take that language, that selfish ambition language from the Apostle Paul, no one ever thinks that they're selfish. You know what we are? We're just doing what we have to do next. We're just surviving. It all makes sense to us. Of course, I can't give away that money because I wouldn't then have it. I'm just looking for the next promotion. I'm just working for our next vacation. I've got to send the kids to college, so we're doing this. No one ever thinks that we're selfish. I just ask my wife to do this. I ask my husband to do this because this is what we have to have. We're not being selfish. We're doing what's necessary. What's necessary for the next step on the ladder, the next step up the rung. That's not selfish. None of us are selfish. This is just the real world. We are all so busy building our own towers. All the time. One of the quirky things about our congregation in Houston is that for some odd reason, we have what I think is a lot of people who are models for a living and a lot of people who are photographers for a living. And some do both. And one of them, a sweet model, she's one of, uh, one of the great people in our community, a couple of months ago hit a threshold for followers on Instagram. And so she was very excited. She had all of these followers on Instagram. And I had a conversation with her a few days after that happened. And I was asking her, I said, well, congratulations. I know that's a big deal to you. And I asked, what does that mean? She kind of looked up and said, I don't know. So much of our striving, of our grasping, our will to build our own tower. And you know what? I don't care who you are or what you've done, how you've built your tower, God still has to come down to see it. But since no one thinks they're selfish, I wouldn't preach that about this text. But there's another option. Evil. Just good old-fashioned evil. And here's the great thing. Evil is really fun to talk about at church. I mean, that's what you came here for. Like, we love to talk about evil and resisting evil. That's great. We don't get so fired up when we use the other word for evil that's more personal, sin. Because the reality is, like, we know that there's evil in the world. We know that we, are, we sin. We don't like to talk about it a whole lot. But really, the truth is, we don't even know how to talk about evil and sin. Because there's a funny thing that happens when we talk about evil, it's always somebody else's problem. Genesis 11 really begins in Genesis 6. And God has this problem in Genesis 6. And if you've read the story, you will know it. If you've read the story of Noah, and it says this, it says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And Genesis goes on to tell us that everybody just did whatever they wanted to do, that they followed their own ways. And God's answer to that in Genesis is the flood to reset the entire system. But now if you fast forward, you still have the same problem. 
Only where you, what you had in Genesis was every man going their own way. What you have in Genesis 11 is the collective pursuing evil. And everyone I've ever known has had a reflex for one or the other. When we talk about evil, it's either the fault of individuals or it's the fault of a collective. Here's how I know. When I was in high school, I was a huge news junkie. And every Sunday, my mom went to the early service, so I had to go with her, and we would come home, and every Sunday I would watch Meet the Press, because that's what all the cool kids were doing. And I remember clearly watching Meet the Press one Sunday, and Jerry Falwell was on. And I remember Falwell saying, God is going to judge America for the sin of abortion. And I thought, all of us? About 10 years ago, there was a movie called 42. And it tells the story of Jackie Robinson's integrating Major League Baseball, breaking the color barrier. And all of my white friends called me and said, you really need to go see 42 because apparently racism was new to them. So I went and saw 42, and when I saw 42, I knew exactly why they liked it. Because all of the racism in the movie was individual people doing individual sins. Earlier this summer, our church in Houston started helping a little community about two and a half hours drive from us recover, and that community was called Uvalde, Texas. And some of you remember the story of the students who were shot and killed at Uvalde. We connected with local churches and pastors there, um, sending aid and food as much as we could do. Do you know what the problem was in Uvalde? you know what caused Uvalde? an individual person. I know that because I heard it on the news. Do you know what also called Uval caused Uvalde? A systemic problem. We have this reflex when talking about evil that says it's all just one person doing one thing, making their own choices. Genesis 6. Or some of us have a reflex that it's all a system problem. Genesis 11. And God seems to be saying, we're really good at both. That maybe the problem isn't just one of those poles. Maybe we're good at both all the time. But that's about abortion and race and guns, so I would never preach that from this text. And there's one final option that maybe that this is about the people of God. Because this is a funky story. And not just about a tower and God coming down and confusing languages. Like, why is it there in the first place? Because if you're reading along in your Bible and you're reading Genesis 10, you know what you get in Genesis 10? What I read you from Genesis 10 is just more of the same. It's names, just a list of names, names that are hard to pronounce, names that you would never name your children, names, names, names. And then the rest of Genesis 11, that's just more names. And so you've got this list of names, this genealogy in Genesis 10, and this other list of names in Genesis 11, and then... Right in the middle, the Tower of Babel. But you know what you get in Genesis 12? Abraham. And Genesis 12 says this, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great 
so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So what if God is saying, we tried the individual thing, where every man, every woman just made up their own decisions, went their own way, and by Genesis 6, that just was not working. And then we tried the collectivist thing, where we build these communities, but these communities were just as selfish and just as ambitious and just as sinful, and that didn't work either. My Genesis 12, what if God is saying, let's try a covenantal family? A family. And that family would become a tribe. And that tribe would become 12 tribes. And those 12 tribes would become a nation. And that nation would give birth to a child who would save the world. And that child would invite all of the peoples all over the earth of whatever language, tribe, or tongue to be the church, to be the people of God. And what if that community really made it their goal to take everything in the world that is out of order and put it back into order? What N.T. Wright calls setting the world to rights. That that would be their mission in the world, that wherever they saw disorder, wherever they saw chaos, wherever they saw injustice, that they would be the people at the forefront of bringing order to putting the story straight. And what if that same group of people resisted imperialism and the cultural coercion that forces ourselves on everyone else That we wouldn't say that you would not have to be like us to be part of us. That we exist for you and you don't have to become like we are. To be part of what we are. And what if that same group of people set aside all of their personal ambition and their appeals to their own rights and their own place in society and said we will take responsibility for others for the sake of this community for the sake of the world. And what if that same group of people resisted evil in all its forms? That when we saw people that we know and love going down a path that was leading them into greater trial and frustration and heartache, that we would resist evil. But then when we saw systems and places where it were broken, where a collective group of people had come together to oppress others, to marginalize others, that we would resist that too. And if we hadn't experienced it personally, that we would actually believe the people who told us what the system was doing to them. What if that community existed? What if that is what God has been up to all the time? I think that would be a fascinating sermon to give. If only we could find a group of people who were interested in hearing it. Let me pray for you. God, give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we would be both challenged and blessed by who you are and what you are, and that we would be forever changed by an encounter with you. And we ask it in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you stand and join with us as we respond to the Word of God? Sing with us. Worthy of every 
song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you, yeah. We live for you. Sing Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. We sing holy. Yeah. blessing that time was to have Sean here and be with us. Um, if you could use prayer for anything, after the service, our prayer team will be back there by the banner and the cross. They would love to pray with you, and I'll be right up here. If we haven't met before, if you're new or looking to get more involved in the church for Christ Church in Five right after the service, and if you're interested in a rooted group, please find Heather in the comments. She would love to share more about that with you. Well, as we go, would you receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you both now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week. Go in peace.